So, Tarams have made a head unit. Now, on paper, this thing looks freaking awesome. Four times 100 watts RMS into two ohms, or two times 200 watts RMS into four ohms. That's 200 watts RMS per door from a head unit. But this doesn't come without its drawbacks, and we're going to be going into some of them today. So, without further ado, let's crack on. So here she is, a single DIN. Now, bear in mind, this is a cheap, affordable unit. It's a very nice price. So, we can let slide that things feel a little bit cheapy. That's absolutely okay. We're not expecting a premium feeling product here. This thing is just designed to perform. Nice and simple on the back. 15 amp fuse, which will need changing if you want to get the full power out of this thing. It explains that in the manual. No analog audio input. The only way of getting sound into this thing is via the USB on the front or by Bluetooth or by FM radio. Switches here for fixed low pass filter and high pass filter on the speaker outputs. We'll get into that later. Naturally, this is going to demand a lot more power than a normal head unit so the included harness has two wires for power two wires for ground which you might think is great however you can't obviously just connect this to your regular vehicle wiring because that's only going to have one wire completely negating the benefit of having two on here so naturally as it says in the manual if you want to get the full power out of this thing you're going to need to run dedicated power and ground to it from the uh, vehicle charging system we do have an rca line output for external amplifiers which we'll get to later the time delay to power up from turning the ignition on is zero one two Three, four, five, about five seconds. The red LEDs are fixed brightness and always on. Volume is set by a digital potentiometer on a rotary encoder. The speed could be a bit quicker for my personal preference, but it's not too bad. Cycling the sources is pretty quick, and the time it takes to start a USB track from cycling the source is about two or three seconds. It's pretty quick. For USB mode, there's no folder names, just numbers. And the same for the tracks, there's no file names or anything like that. The Bluetooth pairing is very fast and works for me every single time, either from powering the unit off and back on again instantly, almost within like a second, connected back to my phone. However, the one drawback is that it disconnects from Bluetooth if you change the source, meaning that when you go back to Bluetooth, it has to reconnect again. But the big question I'm sure you have is, does this make rated power? I've bridged up front and rear channels on a 4 ohm dummy load, and we get just below clipping with 14.6 volts going in, dropping to 14.4 there. We get a 158 watts RMS into the 4 ohm load bridged on front and rear channels. Not quite rated power, but still pretty mental from a head unit. Now, obviously, this is a resistive load which is very stressful for the head unit and it would never be presented with that scenario in real life so with real speakers unless voltage drop across the rails internally it would probably behave like a 200 watt amplifier and to confirm that i've disconnected the dummy load and just hooked up the probe directly to the unloaded head unit and we get a clip point of 14.84 volts so per channel that would give us 110 watts rms into two ohms or bridged into four ohms we get two times 220 watts so yeah provided you've got enough impedance right or you're not driving into a resistive load, this is going to behave like 200 watts times 2 or 100 watts times 4. Pretty awesome. There's really good channel equality, if that's even a term. I'm probing front, left, and right channels, and you can see they look like one trace because they are absolutely identical. Right, let's see what's going on inside. So we've got the power supply MOSFETs here, one push, one pull, PWM generation here. This is the transformer, and it's being rectified by these surface mount rectifier diodes here. Then we've got the rail capacitors, and this is the actual amplifier here, just this chip. This is a 3255, we'll look at the data sheet later. All this really needs to work is power supply, audio input, a couple of settings externally, and then an ALC filter network for the class D audio output before it goes to the speaker terminal. So we've got induction and capacitors here. This is some preamp buffer circuitry. It takes your audio output from the face plate and applies the low pass filter, high pass filter switches there. And also we've got a buffer for the RCA outputs. Looks like we do have some reverse polarity protection diodes here on the board. So that's good to see. And lastly, we've got some components for generating auxiliary supply voltages, plus minus 15 or five volts and 12 volts ref negative rail, that sort of thing. On the face plate board, we have a programmable IC there, probably doing some power delivery stuff. We have our rotary encoder for volume and then we have a daughter board here which is actually the brains behind pretty much everything that you'll use on this head unit it's just a cheap generic thing you'd find from most chinese kind of media players so this will deal with bluetooth we have an fm receiver in there as well i think and it deals with the usb and sd card file navigation the eq presets are also dealt with by this chip as well i believe we'll get to that later the class d switching frequency of the amplifier section is about 390 kilohertz not mega high but it's 
this acceptable for this grade of product? This is the data sheet for the Amplifar IC. You can see here that it actually can make 600 watts. What the hell from this tiny little chip? With enough rail voltage, you can see it claims 315 watts per bridged pair into four ohms. And you can actually mono these four channels down. You bridge front and rear to give you two channels and then you parallel them together, giving you about 600 watts into two ohms parallel bridge. Fuck. Naturally, that's at 10% THD. The 1% THD, you can get about 480 watts in two ohm parallel bridge. And although it's class D, we've come a long way. Look at these THD figures. Although it's low power, it's pretty impressive considering. So the chip is definitely capable of this power that Tarams is raising this at. Imagine it just needs the supply rails and traces and all sorts bolstering up to the chip to make it actually produce that power into a load. But now for the most interesting part of this video, I'm going to show you how it sounds <laughs> and take you through the different EQ modes. I'm going to play a track from the USB recorded directly from the amplifier's output. The first part you'll hear is the original file, then you'll hear the head unit's audio output, and I'll cycle through the different EQ modes. So this is the original track. <laughs> So what the bloody hell is going on with that then? These are some 20 to 20k frequency sweeps from the outputs of the head unit. And there's one for each EQ mode. Normal mode is supposed to be flat, but as you can see, we've got a cheeky smiley face EQ response going on with a bit of a boost on the lower frequencies and a massive chunky boost on the highs. This blue line is a flat reference file just on a downward trend due to being logarithmic. And you can see the normal EQ profile boost starts at around about two and a half, three kilohertz with a massive boost up at like 16. And on the lower frequency stuff, the boost starts at around about 300 hertz and stops at about 40 hertz. The pop preset looks like a fantastic roller coaster ride with some kind of high pass filter on the lower end, all kinds of stuff going on in the mid range, and then a taper off on the highs. That's why it kind of sounds like this. And yeah, as you can see, the mid range stuff you could get away with, but that lack of low and lack of high just makes it sound horrendous. The rock preset looks fairly promising up until you get to like the sort of mid to high stuff. You've got this big boost but it's not quite at the higher end like it is on the normal. It's kind of mid-high. It's going to be really harsh sounding that with a bit of a tape off on the really high stuff. This preset might be somewhat usable if your speakers have a bit of a dip at around 2.7 to 8 kilohertz that will negate the bump there. Otherwise, it looks relatively flat. The jazz preset. Oh, hey, give me the frequency response of a 90-year-old veteran with shell shock. As you can see, we all about that bass and absolutely sod all treble. That 57 hertz be slamming and uh, this is the anti-tinnitus EQ preset by the looks of it. Cow, which I assume is country, is kind of similar-ish to the rock preset. However, the boost at the treble extends continuously upwards right to the top and uh, rather than being in the kind of mid-high range here, we've got a bit less amplitude on lows and mid-range as well. Yeah, this would be less usable and it will come across as extremely bright sounding. So basically, none of these are usable. They all sound like ass and you can't turn it off. I did ask the engineers at Terrence about this and they stated that the norm EQ preset is actually flat. However, they have put a permanent smiley face EQ curve before the amplifier output stage of this head unit. What? That's why the norm preset sweep looked like that. I'm sorry, but that has to be able to be disabled. They said that this fixed EQ curve isn't applied to the RCA output, so let's check that. Um, yeah, well it looks like we've lost the smiley face EQ curve, seems like we have some kind of fixed high pass filter here, which given the fact you'd most likely use these RCA outputs to connect a subwoofer amplifier, that's less than ideal. You can see the fixed high pass filter come into effect here at about 150 hertz. not ideal. Well let's have a look at these low pass and high pass switches on the back of the head unit. Obviously these will be applied on top of whatever EQ setting you've got, plus the smiley face fixed curve. So the high pass filter gives you a curve like this, extremely bright sounding, but it does taper off the low end. And the low pass filter probably is a bit more effective given you've got the smiley face curve will actually enhance the kind of low pass filter roll off steepness, if you like. So you can see the high pass filter on normal EQ starts tapering off there at about 97 hertz, pretty ideal for average door speakers, to be honest. And it's relatively steep as well. And the low pass filter starts coming to effect here at about 
46 hertz, but that's probably more likely the smiley face curve. The actual low pass probably kicks in somewhere around here, sort of 70 hertz there, and it gets quite steep after 110 hertz. And if you were using these together, one front, one rear, you can see here the combined crossover point, there's about 100 hertz. But hold on a minute. If like me, you were thinking you could set up a really easy to install daily system with door speakers on the front channels, high pass filtered, and a little subwoofer on the rears bridged to 200 watts of 4 ohms, well, you're forgetting one thing. This head unit has no way of changing the balance between front and rear outputs. So, depending on what speakers and sub you're using, you're either going to end up with way too overwhelming bass or lackluster bass and too much highs from your door speakers, or you might just get lucky with the kind of correct subwoofer driver and box setup you're using that it turns out relatively balanced. But at all times, no matter what you do, the outputs from front and rear channels are absolutely identical and there's nothing you can do about it. This thing has potential. It's got a decent amplifier IC chip, but it gets let down drastically by the audio processing in here. Now, bear in mind, Tamps haven't made the audio processor, the Bluetooth receiver, etc. in this. They haven't made the amplifier chip. They've just put together the supporting circuitry around these devices like power supply, filter network, preamplifier, etc. So in order to fix this, all Tamps needs to do is to select a better audio interface and processing unit to use in this front plate. Now I know this is a cheaper head unit and we can't expect too much. However, bear in mind that Tarams actually sell the amplifier stage of this basically as the 400 times four, which is less than half the price of this head unit. You could pair that amplifier with a really cheap, basic Chinese low profile thin head unit that has better audio processing. Even just a basic bass and treble adjustment would be better than this. You could pair those two devices together and cram them in the dash in a similar space that this takes up and get a much better experience for a similar price to this. So honestly, I don't recommend this in its current state. However, I have been informed that Terms are working on revisions and better versions of this. So hopefully they see this video and take my notes into account. And yes, I think in future, we will see a fairly respectable head unit from Terms. Nothing crazy compared to what you can get from reputable head unit manufacturers. However, what Terms will have is they'll have an extremely affordable head unit with crazy amounts of power behind it, provided they can sort out the audio processing side of things. I'm going to leave you with some free air excursion of a Pioneer 10-inch connected directly to this head unit. Thank <laughs> you.